So now, our subject today is about after planning the risk-based audit, how can we conduct this risk-based audit? What is the method for us to do the proper testing? They say the process will follow the following. We need to conduct effective audit engagement by doing all these steps. Number one, we need to collect and analyze the evidence. Number two, we need to select the audit sample. Selecting the audit sample, especially when you are doing financial testing, especially when you are looking at transaction, credit card, loans, how you are selecting the sample that is representing the population. How can you ensure you are not making any mistake in sample? And organizing your work of papers and audit program and managing the audit engagement, applying the audit techniques and procedures. What are the right audit techniques and procedures you need to follow? How can you document your audit findings? How can you supervise the staff and how can you conduct the consulting engagement? So these are all the issues that we are gonna address. So let's start with the first one. The first one is the audit evidence and working paper. When we are speaking about the evidence that you need to have, the big question is what kind of evidence you need actually to have when you are collecting uh, uh, you know, the information from the client. So you can write in the question and answer. Usually when you are trying to collect information from customer, what kind of document you collect to be able to use in your testing? Do you usually collect the, the policy and procedures manual? Okay, do you collect actually the number of transactions that they have? Do you collect uh, the log uh, if they have for any errors, for any complaints, for any misconduct? But when we are collecting this evidence, the main issue, can we rely, rely on this evidence? For example, if you ask the organization, do you have policy and procedure? Organization say, of course we have policy and procedure and they give you the policy and procedures. But can we rely if they have policy and procedure and they are telling us that we follow them, that they actually follow them? Maybe they have them, but we don't know if they are followed. If we tell them, give us the customer complaint files, and they say, we have no customer complaints. So I ask them a question. Can you give us the customer complaint files? They say, sir, we don't have uh, complaints. I say, okay, give me the file that's empty. So I need to sh sh uh, see that they have a file that actually the file is empty. The meaning that they are prepared in case of a, a, a customer complaint came. So here is all the question. We can't sometimes rely on all the information that they are giving us. We need to understand which information we can rely on and which information they are not sufficient. We can't rely on. So here, where we need to use professional skepticism and reasonable assurance, the meaning we can't trust everything they say, and we can't also ignore everything they say. So we need to have skepticism in a way to think, okay, what they say maybe is correct, but we always need to check. If they say, for example, I have reviewed the report, I say, I need to ask them, show me evidence showing that you have actually reviewed the report. So always I need to show something that will support the uh, information that they are speaking about. Taking, like we said, nothing for granted. Always try to get uh, evidence to support your conclusion. Always try to understand exactly that when you are conducting audit, some auditors, they say it's about black and white. It's never black and white. It's always about the gray area. The meaning you can't say 100% everything is working according to the policy. And you can't say, you know, nothing working according to the policy. Always there is this gray area where we have some issues we need to address and fix. Also, when you are conducting the audit, you need to consider is this audit is actually adding value. We need to look at the cost benefit analysis. How much the audit is actually costing the organization? How much is actually taking out of your time? And what is the actual benefit that this audit is gonna add to the organization? What is the benefit that we are gonna get from this audit you are conducting? So this is where we need to address all these issues when you are collecting the evidence. All right. Now, what kind of evidence you are collect and what about the quality of this evidence? We say we need to look at the persuasiveness of the evidence. How much this evidence can actually convince us that actually that this is the reality what's happening. We call it the quality of the evidence. So we speak about the appropriateness, the quality of the uh, evidence. We speak about relevant uh, evidence. Is this evidence relevant for me to support my conclusion or is actually not relevant? We speak about sufficiency. When we speak about sufficiency here, we are speaking about what? Not the quality, the quantity. The meaning if you take more samples, if you take more uh, transactions to review, you have now sufficient information to come up with a conclusion that the transaction are done properly. So sometimes you need to take extra sample. Also, we speak about reliability. How reliable this evidence? Which sources are coming from? Is it coming directly from the client, which is less reliable? or is it coming from third party, from outside the organization, or it's coming from actually 
work you have done. You went to the organization and you did inventory count. So you actually collected the evidence yourself. Also, what about, do we have enough evidence? Do we have the sufficient evidence? Always when you are doing testing, you need to know exactly what kind of testing you are doing. We call it, we, are you doing the testing of existence or title and ownership? The meaning when you go to a branch and you are doing cash count, you are actually doing there to ensure that the cash exists, the money is there. But we don't know if this money is actually related to the bank or not. The meaning someone can actually take the money, put it there for you, so you count it, and after that, they will remove it. So the main concept, when you are doing counting for anything, you need to ensure that this counting is done properly. The meaning this actually owned by the organization and it's existing. So this is why you need to define the, your testing. We call it the banana example. When an auditor went to a banana uh, uh, warehouse to count, he counted the banana and he said everything is in place and he wrote his report. But actually the owner of that banana shop, he got the bananas from another shop on consignment just for the auditor to actually audit and say that the bananas are in place. So this is why you need to define your testing. Is it related to the existence or is it related to the ownership? Now we speak about reliability. How reliable are this information that we are testing here? So information from outside the organization is more reliable than information from inside the organization. Information obtained from the internal auditor is definitely more reliable than information we get from the client. Information obtained with the system of effective internal control is much more reliable than getting it from system where we have weaknesses in the internal control. Also, documented evidence is more reliable than undocumented evidence. What's the meaning of documented evidence? Do you see in, in, in UA in the bathrooms, we can see that the cleaner will go clean the bathroom and he will go document that he cleaned the bathroom and supervisor every one hour will come and check the bathrooms and he will document that he supervises staff. This will show us that actually the person is cleaning and he's documenting the cleaning and the supervisor is supervising and documenting that. That is much better than saying, oh yeah, I'm cleaning and the supervisor is actually supervising. So this is where actually we need to have documented evidence. We need to have the information. If someone is reviewing, we need to see a log showing that he reviewed, he have done that review. Also timely evidence is more important than an evidence that you will get later because later they will have time to actually manipulate the information and provide it to you. Also uh, cooperated evidence is more sufficient. You get some information from the client and then you get confirmation from the bank. Th this information from the bank will corroborate the information that the client give you is correct. You get some information from the client, then you get some information from the vendor confirming that this is the amount that they got. So that is more sufficient. Also, when you select larger sample, it's more sufficient than selecting smaller sample. So at the end, why we are speaking about all that? Because you don't want to do testing where the result of the testing will cause disaster. At the end of the day, we are gonna give you know, uh, assurance that uh, the internal control processes are working properly. Then we discover we didn't do the proper testing. We couldn't identify the deficiencies in the system. Now let's speak about the level of reliability. We have three levels. We have high reliability information. Where we get this high reliability information, we get it from document prepared by the internal auditor. The meaning internal auditor will go and do the count. Internal auditor will go and obtain the documents or obtained directly by third party. You send confirmation to the bank and get the information. You send confirmation to the customers and get confirmation. Or when you do an actual testing of the inventory, or where you do a process mapping, you take the process inside the organization and you map it out to explain to the uh, internal audit team how the process is happening. Or when you get confirmation from the bank or confirmation from um, um, a third party that something is happening, or when you get cut off a bank statement or letter from outside the attorney from a legal entity. These are high reliable information that we can use. What about medium reliable information we can use? We say document from outside the organization to the, uh, from outside to organization to internal auditor. So if you got an actual bank statement that the bank sent to the organization and the organization is given to you, it's less reliable than you get it directly from the bank. But you say, yeah, why? If we have a certified bank statement, that the organization is giving us and it's certified stamp by the bank. It's original. No, not really. When I was doing an audit in US, we have an organization, we went to audit and we requested their bank statement and they give us certified bank statement from the bank. The funny thing that when we have contacted the bank, the bank said that they don't have even an account with them. 
So the concept that anyone can create a fake statement and have the stamp of the bank on it looks like an original statement. So this is why it's less reliable than obtaining that from third party directly. Also vendor invoice uh, 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 from customer purchase. So if we have vendor invoice from, for customer purchase, it's, it's not that reliable compared if we speak directly with the customer. Why? Because the organization is involved in the process. What about bank statement? If you obtain it directly from the bank, yes, but if you obtain it from the organization, also we need to question that. What about document created by the organization and then sent to an outside party? Also, manipulation can happen there because the organization is involved. Cancel the check, deposit slip, all of them are actually handled by the organization, so there is a chance that, not like we say they are not reliable, but you know, mod, medium reliability. Why? Because we are afraid they manipulated the process. Which one is we consider low reliability? They are low reliable. We say information collected by the organization and given to you. So anything the organization created, we should not actually rely on it. It's low reliability. We need to test it to ensure it's working. Their policy, their procedures, their report, their time card, their information, their statement. These are the least information we can actually rely on it when we are doing any kind of testing. Now, what are the audit procedures that we can follow when we are conducting these testing? N number one, we can do an inquiry. What's the meaning inquiry? Asking questions to obtain oral or written responses related to the information we are trying to collect. We conduct an interview or we do questioning, we do survey. So it's very important before you start the audit to pick up the phone and give them a call. Ask them what are the issues that you are currently facing? Any actually deficiencies you have in the system? What kind of system and internal control you have in place to manage the risk? What is the level of the risk after managing these controls? What is the acceptable level of risk that board of directors has said for your division? What are you know, the current actually issues that you are facing with the internal control? Are there any deficiencies happen? We go and ask them all these questions. Before, when we go and do the actual audit, we come and sit down with them to try to understand from them what are the, the issues that they have currently in their operation. Do we need to add additional control? Do we need to change the existing control? Do we need actually to look at new risk that we didn't consider before and maybe we need to implement a new control for them? So this is where speaking with management is very important to get their understanding of the process. Also observation. Don't underestimate the observation. Observation is very important. Why? We discussed before. It's all about auditing the culture. You do observation to understand exactly. When you are speaking with this client, do you see he's like happy, excited about the internal control? He's saying, I only follow internal controls because management said I need to follow it and you are gonna come and check. You don't check, only I will not follow the internal control. I don't like the internal controls anymore. Why we have them? So that will show you the culture inside the organization. This is why it's very important for you to actually go and speak with them and observe exactly how the work environment is operating to understand the processes. So watch the people who are doing uh, uh, procedures and processes. However, when you are watching them, what's gonna happen? If you come to someone and you are gonna say, I need to watch you when you are actually doing something. They are gonna behave, they are gonna be smiling, they are gonna be great. So, so what is the solution for us as an auditor? to observe them, to see exactly how things are done. Because if we are gonna observe them when they are doing their job, they will change. Well, you look at the CCTV camera, go to the security department and look at them while they are doing their job from the control room. You will be able to see reality what's happening. So this is why we say observe them when they are doing their job, but not directly. This is one way for you to do it. They say only prove the existence and occurrence. It doesn't add that time when you are or watching them. The meaning only when you watch them, we can see that they are doing this behavior, but we don't know what they have done before or what they are gonna do in the future because behavior can change. But observation is important too. What about inspections? Definitely, we need to go and do an inspection, studying the documents and records and physically examine the tangible resources, not the value. We do inspection, the meaning, we say, open the safe, I need to see that the money is there. But someone will open the safe, you see the money is there. But that doesn't mean that the money is the money. Maybe it's fake money, I don't know. Unless you count it, but just inspection, you can open it and you can see it's there. It's existing there. But we don't know exactly the value unless we do the counting. And in so many cases, what we are interested in, we just want to make sure that they are there. 
and later we can do the testing. But now just by opening, ensuring they are there, we know that the, uh, the documents, the inventory, the cash is actually there in place. So this is one of the things we do. We do inspection. We ensure that actually, for example, the locks are in place, uh, we, but we don't know what's inside sometimes when we observe the locks from outside. So uh, another method is called vouching, which is we call it verifying the existence which is tracking information backward from one document or record to the previously prepared document to test uh, for over uh, stated amount, to test uh, uh, validity. So in that way, we are trying to trace the information to see that actually these transaction, they exist, it happened. For example, sell ship to an actual order sell. So in that way, you are tracking the amount that you shipped or the transaction that you have processed for the document that the customer submitted. So in your example in the bank, you are approving a credit card, you need to go and look at the application. Did the customer fill the application or not? And I will tell you a very simple example for your bank because I applied for a credit card from your bank. I didn't fill any information. The, uh, the customer service representative came to me and he said, sir, I will make your life easy. Here, the application is around four, uh, not four, five, six pages. Just sign here, sign here, sign here, sign here. And they say, what I'm signing on? They said, don't worry, sir. We are going to collect all the information from you and we will fill it. So the question, in that case, I'm only signing. Did I fill the inf information on application? Not really. But I'm signing that these are the information correct based on what he filled. But I don't have copy of what he filled the application on. So maybe I signed and I signed and I signed and I have no idea what the person filled. And he got my information and I don't have an idea if he applied me for the right credit card or not because at the end, you know, I didn't sign for which credit card I'm filling. So this is always the question, what can go wrong? And with the final transaction, we need to do vouching to look at the existence. Do we have the loan application filed by the customer? Do we have the right information? Let me give you an understanding of this uh, concept of uh, 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 loan application or documents. Who is in your branches is filing these documents on behalf of the client? Are the client doing it themselves? or someone is taking an ID of the client and actually filing this application on behalf of the client. So we need to go back to see the signature, to see what happened. In some of the banks, they go see the CCTV camera. Is the customer was in that branch on the day when the application was filed? This is a famous case happened in UAE that they, they discover when they looked at the CCTV camera that the customer was not at that branch on the day when that application was filed. So in that way, what happened? The actual banker, he filed the application without the customer being there for him to, to get a withdrawal from the account. So always we need to go and do the uh, vouching. What about tracing? The tracing, tracking information forward from one document or record or tangible to subsequent one. So it will test completeness, looking at underestimated amount. So here is the opposite. Here we go, we see, is every application that we have got in the bank as a credit card was actually completed, was processed, or do we have some application were not processed, were not completed for one reason or another? And why they were not completed? What are the issues with them? So you can do tracing to see exactly what are the issues with these application loans, accounts that they were not actually processed. So it will test that everything is actually completed. What about uh, re-performance? Sometimes when we are looking at certain reports, and these reports are really important. So what we do, we should not look at only the total number. We need to do re, uh, uh, we need to do totaling. We need to do uh, re-perform the procedures. So redoing the control and the procedures. Uh, 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 check that the numbers are correct. So if you see, for example, a report at the end, there is a number, calculate all these numbers. If you see a procedure is done in the system, go and verify that it's done in the system. So you go and perform the same procedures to test that the procedure is done in the right way. Another way for us when we are doing the testing is we call it NL, uh, audit procedures. What's the meaning of audit procedures? We can follow some kind of analytical procedures. We discussed what's analytical procedures before using financial and non-financial information for us to look for any exceptions. So for example, we see our number of credit cards going up, but we can see that most of these credit cards, customers are not paying on them or they are not spending on them. So the question, are customers only applying for credit card, but they are not using them, why? Maybe the guy, he told all his friends, don't worry, just apply for this credit card, 
don't actually spend any money on them just for me to get my commission for getting customers joining uh, the bank. So this is where we need to ask questions. Or we need to look at uh, other situation, which is interesting, especially in the banking sector. You can see some individuals who are actually trying to get customers for credit card. They understand that these, these sales agents, and this happened here in UAE, the sales agent will come to me and say, sir, would you like to actually apply for a credit card? And if you do this, I will give you 100 dirhams. I will give you two dirhams, uh, 200 dirhams. And I say, why? He said, because I get commission for getting a client. So in that way, because I'm a salesperson, in that case, if you actually apply for that credit card, first, I will appear in front of my boss that I'm getting clients, and I will give you a portion of my commission. And this is very famous technique that he said, don't worry about this credit card. You don't use it. You will just have it. And after that, you can cancel it later. But in that way, you got some money because I'm going to give you the money and you help me. And anyway, the credit card is free. <laughs> There's nothing for you to lose. So is the guy is actually doing this, uh, audit procedures will help us to identify the individual. See, if we test the individual and we see this individual, how many credit cards he's actually getting us and are these credit cards are actually performing? Are we generating revenue from this credit card? Are we uh, uh, making customers spend money on it? And uh, uh, analytical procedures will help us to look at the indicators at the early stage. Also, you can use different kind of, uh, you know, common size analysis, ratio analysis, trend analysis to look at any changes happening in the operation. One of a very good control that usually you do, you can look at the budget compared to the actual performance. So you say how much the actual budgeted amount that we have, and then what is the actual spending? If the actual spending is more than the budget, there is an indicator that something is going wrong. Government entity, in most of the time, they use that. They budget for the beginning of the year, and then they look at the actual. Of course, today, everything had changed. Today, because of Corona, what happened? So many of the government entity, they had to cut their budget. So they had to eliminate so many things on their budget because now, you know, they are actually uh, uh, losing from economic standpoint. And uh, here in GCC, they are losing because of, you know, the, the price of the oil is going down. So this is why their budget is cutting down. And in that way, they need to change the budget. But looking at actual and budget is always a very good measure. Sometimes we do external benchmarking. So we compare our bank with other banks. Sometimes we can do internal benchmarking by comparing branches from different uh, operations inside the bank. So this is where all these are good ways for us to understand exactly how uh, uh, we can look at indicators or issues to show that something is going on. Another way for us to be able to do the testing is getting confirmation. So confirmation, we can obtain it directly from actually the bank, from the customer, from the vendor. And we have two kinds of confirmation. We have positive confirmation, which is actually, uh, we send it to the cl client, we send it to the bank, we send it to the uh, vendor, and we need to get a response from them. Why we call it positive confirmation? Because we call it blank confirmation. We tell them how much the amount that we paid you, how much the amount in the bank account that you have, we don't give them any information. We wait for them and they have to respond to us to tell us what is the amount. So we call it positive confirmation. Usually we do it for material amount, for large amount, or for important transactions. Compared to negative uh, confirmation, sometimes we just want to verify that customers, they got the notification or in our banking situation that customers, they actually approve the disclosures. So we send it to the client. We say, client, when you have applied for a credit card, we just want to make sure that you have read the disclosures and you understood it and you signed it. Please, in case this didn't happen, come back to us. So we call it negative confirmation. We don't want them to respond unless the information we are sharing with them, they are incorrect. So this is the difference between positive confirmation, we use it for big major accounts. Negative confirmation, we use it for things that are not that important or small amounts. Now, so based on that, let's summarize exactly everything we discussed. So usually the terms that we use, we examine documentation. So when you are obtaining documentation, you need to examine them to check that they are valid. We do scanning to look for indication in using analytical, analytical procedures. When we get documentation, we read this documentation to obtain. We compute using analytical procedures to be able to understand if there's any ratios or any issue indicating fraud. We recompute using what? Uh, reperformance. We foot total using reperformance. We do totaling. Also, we do tracing for documentation. 
we do co a comparison between documentation to ensure they are correct. We count, we do inspection over physical uh, 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 evidence, over inventory, and we count it. We do observation of the operation using observed technique, and we go speak with the client, do an interview to collect the information from them. And we do vouching using documentation to obtain an evidence. So these are the different types of terms and evidence that you get from each process. Now let's speak about your working paper. So today, what kind of system are you using? If you tell me you are using words to document your working papers, that's old style. Who's using word anymore to actually document your results? You need to actually use the proper software and that software should actually document your work properly and no one can go and modify it. Why we, we don't use Word? Imagine you go and use Word and you document that you have a deficiency in one branch. Then your supervisor will go and delete this information. You say your supervisor will delete it? Yes. He will say, I changed this information. I don't believe it's deficiency done. Now, no one will, will hear about it from the chief audit executive. No one will hear about it from the audit committee because it's only conversation between you and between the supervisor. Compare if you have an actual system, anything you document in the system is there, where in real time, the chief audit executive can log in, can see it, where even if someone deleted, there's a backup on it on the server, we can go and look back and see exactly what happened, where actually uh, you can actually ensure that no one can even delete it because for them to delete it or do any of that, that will send notification that there's a deficiency was deleted by supervisor. The chief or executive can go and look at it and decide if this is appropriate or not. So this is why we need to upgrade our work when we are doing internal audit work by having the proper system in place. In US, we had a very powerful system where everything was documented. And in a way, when I am working on the testing, no one can log into my actually testing or no one can change anything. For me, once I finish the work, I log out and I give the, the authority for my supervisor to review and any changes he will do, I will be able to observe and see. So this is why, you know, if you have the proper system, our work will be done properly. Compared to now we have a word document and someone will update on that word document, send it to his boss, his boss will update. Sometimes we have 17 version and we are lost. So they say the type of working document that you need to have in place, you need to have documentation related to the nature, existence, and timing of the audit procedures. The meaning for the audit committee, for the board of directors to understand that your conclusion is based on actual testing, you need to explain in your working papers, not in the report, in your working paper, what you have done. So in case actually later, they will ask you what kind of procedure you have done, you have supporting document in your work to say, this is the actual testing that we have done, and this is the documents we have collected, and this is why we reached to this conclusion. Also, you need to actually decide based on that, the time, budget, and resource allocation, how we are gonna allocate our resources. Working papers will help you by saying, okay, these are the methods we are gonna test, these are the process that we are gonna do, we are gonna allocate it between the staff. So it will help you in organizing your work. Also, it will help you in creating questionnaires. We need to differentiate between very important things when we are doing the work, between something called questionnaire and something called survey. When we speak about questionnaire, questionnaire is a specific uh, uh, questions you ask related to the audit. And usually questionnaires, they are long and they have specific information you are trying to collect. Compared to survey, they are general, they are short, they are actually not focused, they are trying just to collect overall information. So usually when we are doing our testing inside our working papers, inside our work program, we have questionnaires. We have so many detailed questions that usually we need to ask the clients or we need to actually answer them by collecting information and evidence from the clients. Also inside your working papers, you will have your process map. You will take the information that you need actually in your audit uh, uh, from the understanding the process and you document it as a process map. We discussed before anything more than five, six steps, you document it in, 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 uh, as a process map. You can have the charts, the graph, the risk maps, all of them as evidence supporting your, your work inside your working papers. You can have the agenda of the meeting, any narrative memoranda, any information you obtain from the client and the organization information. Now, guideline related to the working papers and preparation. What you need to do for every working paper that you need to obtain from the client, you need to document important information. What are these informations that you need to document? You need to document the title, the meaning 
when you take this document, let's say you take a bank statement, you take a report, you need to document what is the title of this document. So in that way, everyone will understand. But the title is not enough. You need to give it a reference number. For, for example, SD1 or REF7. The meaning you are saying reference seven or source document one. So you need to give it a reference number. So later during your audit, you can refer to that reference number. And even better, in case you are using digital auditing, once you upload it to the system, you can link it. So the supervisor, he can just click on the reference and the document can open. And even you can write and, and document your testing on that document. Because if you are using digital system, you will take a scan copy of the document and then he will actually go and add, add another layer on it. We call it testing layer. So that way you can have, you know, uh, uh, what we call cross, uh, uh, cross marks. We can, you can have reference mark. You can have testing on it. You can have notes. So all that you can do it on the source document as an extra level, as a digital copy. So it's very important to have the title and the reference. Also, it's very important to have the date when you have obtained this document. And, and at the same time, you need to uh, uh, mention your initial. You need to sign the document. The meaning you are saying that I was the person who obtained the document. And then your supervisor, after he will review the document, he will sign. So in that way, he is saying, I have reviewed your work and signed off on it. So this is the documentation for us later. So in that way, we will show that we have obtained the document on this day. We have reviewed the document and the supervisor actually signed on this document. So are you using this as a manual base or, or system base? That's the question. What currently are you using manual base or, or system base for you to document this information? You can write that in the question and answer. So if you are using any, any system method or you are using still Word documents and Excel sheet and actually you are ha having hard copy. When I started in US, we, we were using hard copy. That was like uh, 16 years ago. So 16 years ago, I go to the audit and I will bring a file. You remember these old yellow files? And they have like uh, uh, two holes on top. And I will file the actual financial statement on the file. And then we close the file saying, okay, the statement is filed. And I write on top of the file what is inside and I sign on it. It was funny, 16 years ago, we don't have system. But today we have system. Today we have everything in place. So good. So in that way, you mentioned that you have system in place, which is great. Today, the system is really, really important. Now, we discuss everything here related to understanding, you know, what kind of evidence you need to collect and what kind of working papers that you need to have. Now, the question here, which is the question very important, is when you are going to do this testing, what the end result is going to be? The end result is going to be something we call it risk and control matrix. The meaning, you are going to say, based on your audit, that this is, these are the process that we are going to audit. We have a process number one. Why we are auditing it? Because the risk is high. So we have risk A, we are checking that is actually managed. We have risk B, we are checking is managed. We have risk C, we are checking is managed. And how we are checking that this risk is within the acceptable level of risk? Because we are going to test control A and control B and control C. So we have the key controls that we are going to test during our audit to ensure that this risk is managed. So then, before we do the testing, we are going to ask ourselves, this control, is it designed adequ uh, uh, adequately? If the, uh, there's design adequacy of the control, we can say great. If not, we don't test it. Because if already the control is not adequate. The control is not appropriate. So what we need to tell management? We are so sorry to inform you that the control you have in place is actually not adequate. You need to change your control. But in case this control is adequate, we document here that we have reviewed the control and we believe the controls are adequate. So the next stage is actually we need to test to ensure the functionality of the uh, control is working. So let me explain something very important from COSO. COSO said, the first thing you need to look to ensure the design of the control is there properly, adequately. And second, you need to test the effectiveness of the control by understanding the functionality of the control. So they say design and functionality, design, functionality, design to ensure it's adequate, functionality to ensure it's effective. So here where we go and do the actual testing of the control by testing control A, testing control B, testing control C, and then we document the result of this testing. And based on the result of testing A and B and C to see if they are managing the risk, we can provide conclusion if this risk is managed to reduce you know, that risk to the acceptable level by board of directors. Look how nice. 
when you are doing your work, it's very recommended that in your testing to have a structure like this, where you are mentioning exactly what is the risk, what are the controls, if the control is adequate, you are doing the testing and then you are reporting the testing and then you are coming with a result. Why? It will help you and help the audit committee, help your supervisor, ensure that they are following the risk control matrix and they are actually doing the proper testing. It's easy for everyone to understand. So this is a very effective way for you to document your work when you are doing the actual audit. Now, if you are going to do testing of this control A and B and C, what you are going to do, you will need to actually select sample. It's impossible today to do 100% testing unless you have software, unless you have ACL, you have SAS, where the system is going to do the testing of everything. But in so many situations, we don't have all the solutions with us, or we don't have all our documents that we are testing as a, as a digital copy. We have them sometimes manual files. You need to go to every branch, look at the application, verify it manually. And thank God, maybe this is the situation because if everything automated, we can buy a system and we can fire half of you. This is why the internal audit department is big because there are so many manual processes that we need you to go, to go physically and you need to go and do this inspection. So what kind of testing you are going to do? When you are doing sampling, you are selecting less than 100% of the population. You are looking at the, the, uh, why you are doing this? Because you don't have enough time to audit everything. You don't have enough actually money to cover the testing for 100% of the population. And it's a lot of work. But the main important questions that you need to ask when you are doing sampling, what are the main questions? Number one, how many items to select in your sample? And number two, which items to select? And number three, how to evaluate the sample results? Remember, sampling is not only about taking a sample. And what we are going to discuss here is really deep testing to understand exactly that sampling is not going to operation, uh, select uh, 15 credit card application, uh, go to this branch, select 20 transaction. No, no, no. This is not the testing. We need to understand based on the internal audit methodology, what is the way of testing? to do sampling over internal control testing and to do sampling over transaction testing. So what I'm gonna go and speak here about is the actual reality, how things need to be done. I know that so many auditors, they just go with the traditional approach, just select 30 samples and move on. But this is not the right one. So let's understand it from scientific standpoint. We have two kinds of testing. We have statistical sampling and we have non-statistical sampling. So what is the difference between them? When we speak about statistical sampling, you are using mathematics, you are using statistics to come up with the best approach to select the sample based on understanding how much, uh, how, how much is the size of the sample, which items to select in the population, and how can you do the testing. So we are using statistics. Now, when do we use the statistics usually? If you are testing something that you really don't know where are the issues, the error, you don't actually understand anything about that operation, you use the statistics because statistics can give you the best results. However, if you are testing a division, if you are testing a department, if you are doing a testing of certain process, where based on your experience, understanding, you know exactly that the errors are happening in this month or happening in that division or happening by that individual, you don't use statistical sampling because statistical sampling may not select that person. You go and actually use non-statistical sampling based on your experience and belief because you know what you are looking for to be able to find exactly that things that is actually with deficiency. So this is the decision. You need to ask yourself, do we know where are the issues or we have no idea? After that, if we are using sampling, we need to understand very important concept called representative sample concept. The meaning when we are selecting a sample from the population, is the sample representing the population or not? You can see here, we have the population and we have selected the sample. What do you think? Is, is the sample representing or not representing? Give me your comments here in the question and answer. Is the sample representing or not, not representing? What do you think? Here we have three uh, blue, we have three uh, uh, green, and we have six red. Is the sample representing or it's not actually representing the population? Yes, it's representing, good. 
So, so some of you are interacting, great. So this, the sample is representing here. Why the sample is representing? Because we can see that we have one blue, we can see we have two red, and we can see we have one green, which is good. But if we selected the sample and the sample is not representing the meaning, we have an error. We are gonna reach an, an, an error. This is why they say, in selecting the sample, you need to have the proper way to select sample that's representing the actual population. And what can go wrong? We have two things can go wrong. We call it sampling risk and non-sampling risk. So let's discuss and understand that. What is the meaning sampling risk and non-sampling risk? If we have sampling risk and non-sampling risk, that will lead us to something called audit risk. What is the audit risk? Audit risk is the risk that reaching invalid conclusion based on the audit work. So what you are saying, you are saying, we have tested the operation and there are no deficiencies, but that's not correct. Because you didn't select the right sample, you couldn't find the deficiencies. So look what they say. Example for it in UAE. In UAE, we have so many sand in the air. Did you go to any uh, uh, one-star hotel here in UAE and you decided to take a shower? If you go to one-star hotel in UAE and decide to take a shower, the minute you open the shower, not water will come, water with the sand, mud will come from the shower. Why? Because these water tanks, that they are on top of the building, Usually, sands can come to them because we are living in a, sand, a, a, a desert, sandy environment. So this is why there is a risk that the sand is going to come inside the water of your water tank. So what we do to make sure we manage that inherent risk, we implement controls. So they have actually different filters inside that water tank to ensure that that would not allow the sand to reach the water. But sometimes these filters will not work. Why? Because they have, for example, holes or they are not actually installed properly. So what we do every year, we have the inspection company will come and they do an inspection. They take a sample of the water to see, are there any sands inside the water? If there is a sand inside the water, they will say the meaning something wrong. With what? With the filters. So we need to change the filters. If there is no sand inside the water, they say the filters are working fine. And this is exactly what will happen. We call the risk inside the organization is the inherent risk. It's the sand. And the control that management is implementing is actually the filter. But there is a risk that the control that management is actually uh, implementing is not working effectively. We call it control risk. And then you need to come and do the inspection, which is here the detection. And there is a risk that your inspection will fail. And if your inspection will fail, we end up with audit risk. We end up saying to everyone that you can go and take shower, and then when they take shower, all sands will come with the shower. And this is what can happen. Even don't go to one star hotel. Go to your home. Leave your uh, water without any. Uh, with, uh, leave your home with no running water for one month, two months, and come and open it, and you can see that all these sands that accumulated in your water tank will come down. So the meaning there, we have some sands coming to our water tank. So how can we actually understand that and ensure that this is not happening in your audit? The first risk is called sampling risk. Look what happened here. The, the uh, auditor went and selected a sample, but can you see here? Let me get your feedback. Is this sample representing of what happened or not? What do you think? Is this sample representing? Look at the sample. We have selected a sample and is this sample representing or not? What do you think? You are saying, no, it's not representing. Yes, why it's not representing? Because the, the population, we have green, blue, and red. But the sample said only red. So the question here, what went wrong? Why the auditor was not able to select the right sample? Maybe because he selected very small sample. So in that way, the sample is not representing the population. So we recommend the auditor to adjust their sample size to increase their sample size. Or maybe he didn't use the proper way of selecting the samples. You say, yeah, what's the meaning proper way of selecting the sample? Give you an example. How many of you, you go and you are testing a branch and you tell them, give us the last 10 loans you have approved. Well, getting the last 10 loans that approved, they don't represent the sample because they don't represent all the loans that the division gave in the last one year. You only select the last 10. And most likely the last 10 are correct because you already informed them a month before the two are gonna come. So they say, okay, auditors are gonna come. From now on, we need to make sure all the documentation are in place. So you come, you do that thing, you say everything is according to the procedures. This is why you need to be careful how you are selecting the sample out of that population. You can end up with sampling risk. So what will happen when you have sampling risk? Look what can happen here. 
sometimes you will make the correct decision. The meaning, the, uh, the uh, deviation rate is less than the tolerable rate. The meaning there are no errors. And you did the testing and you said there are no errors. So in that way, and, and, and that's correct. Or sometimes what will happen? Sometimes there are errors and you go do the testing and discover there are errors. But what are the issues? The issues that can happen that if actually there are errors in the operation and you go and do the testing and you say there are no errors. We call you, you reach incorrect decision. So again, the first testing that you go and do the testing and you say there are no errors, but actually there are errors. So in that way, what? In that way, you didn't write the right assurance because you didn't make the right decision. But also what can happen, you can go and say there are errors, but there are no errors. We call that false positive. I mean, you are so happy, it's false positive, there are errors. Then we discover later that there are no errors. Why we call it false positive? This is the same concept when a lady, she will go to testing and she will discover she's pregnant and she's so happy informing her husband and the whole family. Then she will discover that the actual machine was not giving her the right result. We call it false positive. So we don't want you to be in that situation, going arguing with the management about an issue, thinking it's actually a deviation in deficiency and then we discover later it's not. We want you to be in two sides where if there are no deficiencies, you are saying there are no deficiencies, or if there's deficiency, you are highlighting it. So what is the second risk that can happen? We call it non-sampling risk. So look here what happened. Let me ask you here, is the population representing what happened? What do you think? This is not the population. Is the sample representing the, the population here? What do you think? Is it representing? Yes, it's representing the population, right? It's representing exactly what happened. But what happened to the auditor? The auditor said that all of them are red. What's wrong with the auditor? The meaning the auditor actually failed to recognize the exception. The meaning you have selected 20 credit card application and five of them, the customer didn't sign them. And you say all the application were signed. <laughs> what, what happened with your eyes? You were not actually looking and doing the examination. Sometime auditors will not do the proper testing. They will fail to recognize the exception. Or sometimes they use the inappropriate tools. So in that way, because they are using the inappropriate tools, they will not be able to find the deficiency. The same example of the water. The inspector who came to do inspection of the water, he was not using the right tool. So the results came that there is no sand in the water, but there is a lot of sand in the water. So you need to make sure you use the proper tool. For example, if you are using ACL inside your organization and you are searching for any payment going to Mr. Muhammad, Mr. Muhammad can have so many ways of writing. It can be with O, with U, with two M's. So if you don't apply the right filters, what will happen? You say, we have tested everything and there are no transactions for Mr. Muhammad. So this is what can happen. You need to apply all the filters, all the possible names for Mr. Muhammad, because we don't know how it's actually written in the documents. Otherwise, you are going to say, yes, we have tested and everything is okay. And this, we call it non-sampling risk. The meaning you have selected the right sample, but when you are doing the testing on it, you failed because you were not actually recognizing the exception or using the right tool. The other thing is very important to ensure that we have probabilistic sample selection. The meaning every sample unit inside your organization, they have the same chance of being selected. Not some of them are available and some of them are not available. Now, let's discuss the sampling technique. How can you conduct uh, uh, testing? We have four ways of doing sampling. Number one, simple random sampling. Number two, systematic sample selection. Three, probability proportion to size. And, and finally, stratified sampling. Let's go over them one by one. Number one is simple random sampling. So simple, simple random sampling is an easy process, right? So what do you do with this process? You are actually randomly going to select three out of seven. So you run random numbers. You can do that with ACL and then randomly with, with select for you. What about systematic sampling? But before I move on, the question here for you as an auditor, when should I use simple random? Because so many of you say, oh, randomly select. No, 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 no. When should I use simple random? We say when we don't care about the population. The meaning any items in the population, it's okay for us to take it. We don't care about the population. The meaning we do it when we are doing testing of transactions. We don't do it when we are testing a process. We do it when we are testing transactions because we don't care. Any item of the population is okay. But if we are testing a process, if we are testing a, 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 a procedure, what we need to do, we need to use systematic sample selection. 
Why we use systematic sample selection? We are testing control procedure process because we need to ensure that the employee, every five customers, he got one customer doing it right. Every five customers. So if we are testing the a loan officer to ensure he's giving loan properly and he gave 70 loans, we are saying every 10 loans, we select one. Every 10 loans, we select one. So we can see there's consistency over the loans approval process that he's doing. But if we do random sample, maybe we'll select the last five loans or the first three loans, we don't know. So we say we use a systematic sample selection when auditor is trying to look for item over a certain period of time. So most of the time, if you are testing a process over a period of time, or you are trying to look at the sequence, of the transaction, every five transactions you select one, you use systematic sampling. Like here, one, two, three, uh, four, we select. Five, six, seven, seven, we select. So in that way, you use systematic sampling. What about probability proportion to size? This is interesting testing. I don't know if you do this, but in the banking sector, they use it a lot. Probability proportion to size is by focusing that our testing, especially in the bank, should not be on the number of transactions. Because number of transactions doesn't mean anything. What we need to look at, the dollar amount. The meaning, think about it like this. Every time our bank is giving 1 million dirham loan, we need to check that loan that make us reach to 1 million to actually check if it's processed properly. Because in that way, you are providing assurance to the bank. Let's say your bank give uh, this year, uh, for example, a seven, uh, 7 billion loan. So that's with 7 billion, you are saying every 100 million loan, we take that loan, that make us reach 100 million, we test it. Then 200 uh, million, we take that loan, make us reach 200 and we test it. So you are providing assurance to the bank that every 100 million loan we have give, we have selected a sample out of it. Compare when you select random sample, maybe you select small loans, big loans, old loans, new loans, we don't know. So this is what we call it, a probability proportion to size. It's a way for us to select item based on the dollar amount, where every one dollar we consider it as a sample. Let me give you an example. Here we have the processes happen related to $5,000. So, and we are gonna select four uh, items as a sample. Rather than selecting random, where maybe we select 80, 70, 50, 30, 100, I don't know, we use based on the dollar amount because we are trying to say every time the organization will actually generate revenue for 1,250, we select that invoice. So let's go from the beginning. 80, nothing, 70, nothing, 40, it was still 550, 90, that's it. Okay, 1,600, now we reach, we hit the 1,250, now we select that as a sample. Then we continue, we select that as a sample. So this is a way for us to be able to select our samples based on probability proportion to size. So when we use this method, when we are testing for dollar amount, so anything when you are testing the amount, the dollars like sales, you are testing actually the payment, you are testing anything related to dollar figure, you use the probability proportion to size. Now, finally, sometimes we use certified sampling. What's the meaning of certified sampling? In your testing, your manager said, I don't want you to test everything together. Take the personal loans one side, take the mortgage loans one side, and take the commercial loans one side. And that way you are separating the different types of loans. We are not looking at all the loans, we are looking at the different kinds of loans, and we are selecting samples from each type of these loans. So in that way, we are making sure our sample is representing all the different kinds of loans. So we call it classified, stratified sampling, when you are dividing the population into subpopulation and you are selecting samples from this population for you to do the testing. So these are the four methods that we use based on statistics to be able to select the right sample while we are doing our testing. Now, let me give you an exercise for us to do here. So that way you get an understanding of how can we select these samples. So let's say you are examining certain checks that happen inside your organization and the company paid uh, uh, about 300 checks in the last three months. So checks above 6,000 dirham, they require two signatures. A check about uh, more uh, above 1,000 and only it should be, be paid uh, after uh, approval process and auditor decided to select sample of this check to do the testing. So this is the exercise we have. Okay, so let me repeat. A checks more than 6,000, we need two signatures a check more than 1,000, we need a formal approval process. And we have 300 checks. And here are the checks that we have. 
Now, this is an interactive exercise, so I want you to be uh, interacting to be part of it. You tell me here, what about the first one? We have 10 checks, and these checks are more than 6,000. How much is the sample size? How, much we, how many checks we need to select from them? My suggestion, exactly, all of them. Why? Because this is high amount, and we need to ensure that the procedure is follow. And the number of checks is not so much. If we have 20, 30 checks, yes. But because the number is small and we need to verify that the control is working effectively, we can actually select all the 10. So we select the 10 samples. So what is the selection method in that way? There is no selection method. We selected all the population. All right, now let's go to the next one. Next one, we have what? We have 120 checks between 6,000 and 1,000. Now we need to ensure that the supervisor approve these checks. So how much is the sample size we need to select in that case? Good. Now we have the remaining of the check. We have 150 check, less than 1,000. There are no controls on them. We just need to select them to see that they are actually paid properly. What do you think the sample size should be in that case? Now the final one, we have 20 checks that are void. What's the meaning void? Remember, these are not canceled checks, they are void. The meaning we have written these checks and then for one reason or another, we decide not to process them. So we have voided them. The meaning these checks were not submitted to the bank, they were not processed, we just voided them. So the question here, how many sample we need to select out of it? We should not select them all, why? They are not processed. Imagine you are gonna tell your management, we are gonna go to Emirates MBD bank and we are gonna select all the loan applications that they were rejected. And the bank say, uh, excuse me? Habibi, we are not making any money from them. <laughs> We rejected them. So don't tell me you are going to select them all to do the testing on them because what's the benefit to check that why we rejected them? Okay, maybe you can select a sample of them to check on them, but don't select them all. Select the major loans that we gave over 100 million to check that they are actually approved properly. So we should not select them all. Remember, these checks, they were not actually processed. So how we are going to select out of these 20 the actual checks that we are going to examine. What is the method we need to use? So this is what will come up with a conclusion. So in that way, we are selecting 10 out of the 10, 100% testing, we are selecting 15 out of 120, we are doing systematic sample, then we are selecting 20 out of 150 doing random sampling, and we are selecting five out of void check using probability proportion to size sample. And the whole idea of discussing this here, that when you are doing audit, you need to do risk-based. And you can see this will show you risk-based concept. Risky items, we need to do more sampling out of it. Sometimes 100% testing. More risky items, like checks between 6,000 and 1,000, we need to use a special method to identify issues with the process. Less risky, we use different method. So you need to always focus on the risk. What are we testing here? The less risk, the less sample we select. Now, everything we discussed so far is about what? Is about doing things using statistics. Now, what about if we are doing non-statistical sampling? The meaning, you, from your experience, your knowledge, your understanding of the process, you know exactly where are the issues that they are gonna, uh, you are going to have during your audit. So we have different ways. The first one, we call it direct sample selection. The second one, we call it block sample selection. The third one, we call it hoverized. Uh, sample selection. Let's go over them. Number one, we call direct sample selection. The meaning, your knowledge and experience and understanding of the process can tell you which section to, and which sample to select. I know that this individual is new. He is making errors. Or I know that actually this person, he got no knowledge and experience, so he is going to have issues. So they say, in that way, select item based on your judgment. And the items most likely will have the mistake. So you know exactly where are the uh, 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 issues. Items is containing select population characteristics. Very simple example of it when you go to an audit, you say, we are going to look at the loans with high amount. Why? Because these loans with high amounts, most likely they are critical, they are important, and there are so many chances that there are some issues in them. So you believe you are going to look at materiality. See, the minute you use the concept, materiality is not statistics anymore. Because the items, they don't have the same probability of being selected. You are only selected large items because you are trying to focus on materiality. So this is called direct sample selection. The other one called block sample selection. So what's the concept of block sample selection? 
selecting a number of items in sequence. Auditor must select certain block. So the meaning you go to the bank and you say, we want all the loans that were approved by Fujaira branch. Why? Because you know that branch is far away from the head office, is sitting there in Fujaira. Maybe we have issues. Or you have a new employee. He is actually accepting credit card. And you believe maybe this new employee, he is actually taking advantage of the system. So you say, select all the credit card from that employee. See, you are not doing random selection, you are doing block selection. You are selecting all the transaction for a certain division, or you can use time. For example, all the loans approved in Ramadan, we need to select them, why? Employees in Ramadan, maybe they are relaxed, maybe they are saying, oh, this customer needs the money, maybe we can approve his application. So this is why you can actually go and select based on time, select based on process, select based on location, based on an individual, you select all the block of the sample. Now, the final one called Havarai sample. Now, Havarai sample is an interesting concept and it's being used so many times by auditors. This is why it's very important to understand how can you use it in your testing. We say selection of item without any bias on the part of the auditor. So when you are selecting the samples, you are not biased, but you are selecting the sample that will help you achieve your objective in the audit. I'll give you an example. You are testing the HR department. While you are testing the HR department, you want to test the hiring and firing process. Now, you are testing the hiring and firing process. What sample you should select? You say, well, the organization, they hired around 1,000 employees over the last three years. Let's do statistical sampling. No. Why not statistical sampling? Because if you do statistical sampling, you may get some employees that we hired three years ago. And these employees, maybe they already left the organization. Or maybe three years ago, the HR, they were not following the policy and procedures. So in that way, you are going to blame them about what, what happened three years ago. So what do we do? Our objective as auditors is to ensure that HR today is following policy and procedures. So how can we check that HR today and tomorrow they are following policy and procedures? We tell HR, we need a sample of the last 10 employees that you have hired. So if we go and select the last 10 employees that they have hired and we ensure that they are actually following the policy and procedure and they are hiring them in the right way, we select the last 10 employees that they have, uh, that they have fired and we check that they are doing it in the right way, that will give us assurance that today the business process is being followed properly. So sometimes we have to select a sample that will help us in achieving the objective, not based on any bias. That meaning we don't know where are the issues. We are just selecting a sample that confirming exactly what's going on with us. So this is the horizon sample selection. Now, the question that we need to answer, do we have different kind of testing for us to do related to sampling when we are speaking about testing internal controls and testing transactions? The answer is yes. When you are doing audit testing, you need to figure out what is the proper way of testing internal control. We call it compliance testing. And what is the proper way of testing the transaction? We call it substantive testing. And what is the other method of testing balance accounts? If you are testing an actual amount on the balance sheet, actual amount in a financial report. So let's go and understand what are the different methods that we use for, our, 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 for us to do sampling when we are doing testing of internal controls compared to transaction. So the first thing, if you are testing internal controls, there is a special way of testing the internal controls. If you follow, it will make your life easy. The first question you need to ask, do we believe there is a fraud happening in that process? The meaning, if you have heard or if you have uh, uh, noticed any, any issues that will indicate maybe there is a fraud or if there are actually fraud happened recently and you believe there is a fraud, you need to do completely different testing related to the internal control compared if you believe there is not, no fraud, not, nothing happened. So the first question, if you suspect a fraud, you go and you use discover sampling. What's the meaning discover sampling? Discover sampling, the meaning you are gonna go and test one by one. See, it's not sample. We're gonna test transaction number one, transaction number two, transaction number 300, 700, one by one, until you find at least one transaction that is not following the policy and procedure and say, ah, there's a loan, was actually approved, and we don't have supporting document for the seller certificate. We found it. So that's an indication that something wrong with the internal control, fraud, someone is actually doing something and he is taking advantage of the system. He is taking maybe bribe from the customer, we don't know, but this is where we need to send it to investigation. Why this person approved a loan without supporting documents? 
So if you believe that there is a fraud involved, you need to select something. Now, someone will ask, ask me, are you going to do 100% testing? No, 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 no. The statistics will say, if you do 70 to 80% testing of the population and you found no issue, you can provide reasonable assurance. See, it's not 100%. Reasonable assurance that uh, with a 95% confidence that actually there, uh, there are no uh, fraud found so far. So this is what, what you do one by one, one by one. There is no statistical sampling in it. This is if we believe there is a fraud. Now, what if we don't believe there is a fraud? We go to the next item. Do we expect low error rate or high error rate? Now, someone will ask me, Iyad, what do you mean do you expect low error rate or high error rate? Let me give you an example. Last year, you have audited HR. And when you audited HR, you notice there are so many errors, so many issues. So if you are going to audit it this year, what do you are going to expect? You say, of course, there are so many issues. But if you audited the HR last year and you notice they follow the procedures, hardly there are any issues. And today you are auditing them again. Should you also select 20 employees to do this thing? The logic will say no. Why? Because you are wasting your time. You already audited them last time and you selected a large sample and there's no issue. So what is the right approach? We call it stop and go. Stop and go approach is very interesting when you are doing testing, especially inside the bank. Why? Because it will help you save time. The concept of stop and go is the following. You are going to say that the error rate should be less than 12% and the population is 50. We are not going to select 20 out of the population. No, you select a small sample. If in the small sample we don't see any errors, we move on. If we see some errors, we expand the sample. If we see no errors, we stop. If we see more errors, we expand the sample. The meaning, why are you going to waste your time and select from the beginning, large sample, and then you discover there are no errors? No, select a small sample. If they have errors, you expand. If they have no error, you go. This is why we call it stop and go sample. So let's go in an exercise. We select 10%, which is five. We say, okay, okay, we have one. So in that way, we have one out of uh, five. So we say the error rate is 20. So what we can, in that case, we say, well, maybe there are more errors. We expand, we select more. We select 10, 10 out of 10, only when there's error, so it's 10%, so we say we stop. So the main concept is don't start by selecting large sample. If you believe based on your previous testing that most likely the amount of error is gonna be not so much. For example, you audited that branch last year and everything is okay. This year, don't come and do the same testing you do on a branch that they have error. No, go and select less sample. If you see there are no errors, move on. If you see some errors, expand your sample. That will save you time. That will help you manage your resources properly. All right, now what if you believe they have a lot of errors? In that case, we use attribute sampling. So attribute sampling is the method. Let me explain to you what's the meaning of attribute sampling. Attribute sampling, remember, we are testing internal control. When we are testing internal control, before we start the testing, we need to ask what are the attributes that can define that this is deficiency. What's the meaning attribute that will define something as deficiency? For example, this clicker that I have with my hand, how can the organization say that we have deficiency? For example, if the logo was not printed on it, the organization maybe say it's deficiency, this is out. Or maybe actually if, if, if it's broken from one side, they can say it's deficiency, it's not correct. Or if the coloring was not done properly on it, there are some white spots, they say this is deficiency. So because we are doing testing of internal control, we need to say what are the deficiencies that can have inside the internal control that can lead us to say that this control is not working properly. This is why we call it attribute sampling. Let me explain it more by going over an example of attribute sampling. So attribute sampling is statistical method used to estimate the population rate of occurrence, the characteristics in the population, meaning what items we consider as deficiency when we are doing transaction. Give you an example in your uh, bank operation. If the loan was approved without signature from the supervisor, deficiency in the approval process. If the loan was approved without supporting document, deficiency. If the loan was approved without the customer signing the application, it deficiency. So once you list all these attributes before your testing that you can say, if we find any of them, we can say there's a deficiency. Now you can do testing of internal control because you need to check that all these attributes are there. If any one of them is missing, we consider this is a deficiency. 
And why we are saying that? Because we need to calculate out of the 50 loans that you are testing, how many of them they have any of these deficiencies. If they have any of them, in that way we call it, they are missing one of the attributes. So let me go over an example. Here is an example. We have the vendor and we have the company. The vendor agreed with the company that they are gonna sell them uh, 10 units at 1,000. See an agreement, all of us, we agree here. Now look what happened in reality. What happened in the reality? The vendor shipped to the company 12 units at 1,000 and the company actually paid him because he sent an invoice for 12,000. So what do you think went wrong here? Let me get your feedback in the uh, 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 question and answer. What do you think went here? What, what went wrong? These guys, they got paid based on what? We have a purchase order that we have sent them and we told them we need 10 laptops based uh, uh, on 1,000 price per laptop or per unit. How come the organization actually send us that? They say, based on the number of units, yes, but what, what is wrong? Why? They paid them based on what? Usually you get paid, like for example, your class here, when I am delivering to your bank, I send them, they send me a purchase order and based on that I am delivering. So imagine if I, and the purchase order said between me and your bank, for every uh, two hours I deliver, I get, for example, 10,000. And then I decided to increase the number of hours. Then I submitted to your bank that I deliver to you 20 uh, hours, so I get more money. Is this proper? Do you think the bank will say, oh, yes, he had delivered more classes than we agreed, so in that way we will pay him. So what is the process? The additional two units, they are not matching the invoice order. Yes. So in that case, we can say here that they paid based on the receiving report. No one look at the purchase order. So the deficiency here, that management, the accounting department, like so many accounting departments in UAE, they make the payment based on two things, based on the invoice and the receiving report. They check with the unit. Have you received the training? Yes. How many hours? 20 hours. But the purchase order said only 12. Did you receive the invoice? Yes. How much is the invoice? For 20 hours. But what about verifying that with the purchase order? Most of the organization, unfortunately, they create the purchase order after <laughs> the invoice being submitted. So in that way, they follow whatever was actually listed in the invoice, rather wherever the purchase order should be. So this is why it should always the payment be on not only the receiving report, should be paid also on the purchase order. Okay, let's see at the, the situation. What happened here? The vendor shipped eight unit to the uh, company and then he invoiced the company, but he charged him 1,200 per unit. And then the company paid him the money. What do you think here happened? They paid the client based on what? They say they paid the client based on what? Based on the purchase order. No one look at the receiving report. No one examine how many delegates, uh, how many units they got. The same thing. If I deliver the training to you, but I deliver the training only 10 hours, and then you confirm to your uh, HR that you received the training for 10 hours. Then actually, the H I submit the invoice. Well, I will submit the invoice and the HR will pay me because they are not verifying how many hours I deliver. They just say the training was delivered and the department confirmed, so you get your money. But they need to actually look at the receiving report. They need to verify with the unit how many actually hours they got. If they don't verify with the department, that's the issue. So based on that, we can identify the deficiency. Why I'm giving this example? Because this example will help you identify the deficiency, the attributes in the internal control related to a payment to a vendor. So what are here the deficiency if we want to summarize? They say the objective of the internal control related to paying a vendor. Number one, only approved vendor will be paid. If the vendor is not approved, he can't be paid. So first, when I'm doing business with you in Emirates MBD, the first thing your manager said, yeah, we need to verify if your organization listed with us as approved vendor. If I'm approved vendor, okay, we can go ahead. If you are not approved vendor, we can do business with you. So first I was approved. Second, only product order should be delivered. The meaning I should not deliver training to you unless I have purchase order from your organization saying, yeah, we are gonna pay you for the training you are gonna deliver. And finally, only product order should be uh, paid for. The meaning if I give you extra hours, they will not pay me for it. They say only the products that we all requested. If I give you other training, they should not be paying me for it. So if any of these attributes are not in place, we can consider that the payment got a deficiency. And we can consider it. this is deficiency number one, this is deficiency number two. These are the deficiency in the process. So to do the testing here, what the organization will do, will select 
invoices that were paid in the last six months. See, we don't select invoices that are not paid yet. How can we verify? We need to select the invoices that they have paid. Then we need to look at defining the control deficiency, effectiveness, uh, deviation. What's the meaning of that? We have three devi deviations. If we find any one of them, we can consider that we have an issue in our testing. Number one, purchase order is not approved. A loan in your bank was not approved. Or the purchase order is not matching the receiving report in your bank. <laughs> the amount that the client requested is not matching how many we gave him. Or the purchase order is not matching the invoice. The amount that the client got approved is not the amount he got, right? So you say, yeah, this can happen in the banking sector. Of course, there's a big banking, a big fraud case happened in one of the banks where the client actually requested a certain facilitation of payment uh, uh, as a uh, line of credit and the, the officer gave him more than he requested, but he was not aware about it and the banker took the rest. So this is where we need to ensure the matching is in place. The purchase order is approved, the purchase order matching receiving report and the purchase order matching the invoice. Then we go do testing of it. So this is the whole idea of attribute testing. Now let's speak about testing of transactions. See, testing of internal control, we finished from. Now, what about transactions? They say when we are testing transactions, for example, you are testing all the loans that your branch gave out, or we are testing all the amount of credit card payment that actually you have uh, processed for certain clients, or whatever you are processing. If you are processing anything as a transaction, the meaning you have set of transactions, you have 1 million transactions, 7,000 transactions. The first question we need to ask is the book value of the population is available. You say, yeah, what's the meaning of big book value of the population is available? The meaning, you go to the department and you say, how many uh, loans you have? They say, we have 7,000 loans. You say, do we have number which show the total number of these loans? They say, no, no not really. We need to get all these loans and we need to add all the numbers to know the total. So if we need to know before doing testing of anything, credit card, for example, before doing testing on them, do we know the total number of the amount? If we don't know the total number of the amount and we need to do it manually, sometimes it's hard for us to do it manually. Imagine 7,000, we need to get, okay, first credit card, show me what is the number. Okay, add it to, to this. Sometimes the system can generate it, sometimes it's not. And this is where the question you need to ask. If we know the book value of the population, we go one way. But if we don't know, we go another way. So let's say if we know, if we know that the total number of actually loans, let's say they're around uh, 3 billion. Next question, do we, accept the, do we expect there's differences between them? The meaning, do we expect that uh, the amount of loans, they are different? If we believe the amount of loans are different, we use monetary sampling, unit sampling, for us to be able to see exactly the meaning. The way that we do it in that case, if we believe there is a difference or there is no difference. For example, give you a very simple example so you understand. If we are offering special loan, saying that you can come and apply for a loan, it's only 10,000 and that's the loan 10,000. So if in that way, all the customers are gonna get 10,000, 10,000, 10,000, 10,000. So it's easy for us to do the testing on that because we are trying to verify that actually they apply for 10,000 and they got 10,000. So this is why we use monetary unit sampling by looking at exactly how much they got and we don't expect differences between them. But if we have differences, the meaning, one person will get 20 million, one person will get 1 million, one person will get 100 million. So what we will do, we will use a, a, a monetary uh, 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 per unit or we use difference or ratio estimates. So let me explain that so you understand. Let's speak with ratio estimates. We will come back to difference, but it's just easy to understand. Let's say that your bank is giving 3 billion. So we know the total amount, great. And we know that the amount are not similar. We have small loans and big loans. What your testing is saying, let's select out of these loans that we give, let's say they are uh, uh, 30,000 loans. We selected out of these 30,000 loans, 40 loans, and we tested these loans and we discovered that for three loans, three loans that they were processed by Mr. Saeed, he was only charging client 3.5 interest rate, but he should be charging them 4% interest rate. Only Mr. Said, the rest of the loans are okay. And why? Because Mr. Said was selecting the wrong promotional code in the application, because at that time we have a promotion, but he was selecting the wrong promotional code. He should select four rather than 3.5%. 
So if this is the case, the meaning of it, we will need to go to look at all the transactions of Mr. Said, and we need to see how much is the total transaction that he used and he selected that promotion for and multiply it by the half percent that we have a difference with and we need to submit to the management that the actual deficiencies in the loans based on our testing is this is the amount. Now, if it's material, we need to address it with the management and we need to figure out what is the solution. If it's immaterial, we just say in that way, we have issue in processing that transaction and he need to actually make sure he's processing it right in the, right, in, in the future. So this is called the ratio estimate. It's based on a percentage ratio related to a transaction. When we speak about the difference estimates, what will happen in the difference estimates? This is what will happen in hotels, for example. Hotels, they have to charge for every customer who's going to the hotel 10 dirham per day. We, we call it a per day, per room uh, tax that you have to pay to Dubai government. So what if a customer actually going there and he is interacting with one salesperson and this salesperson forgot to charge him because he forgot that the rules of the uh, government here is you need to charge 10 dirham per customer. The meaning, again, we go to this person in the hotel and we see all the customers that he didn't charge them. And we multiply every, how many nights they stay in the hotel with that amount, we come up with the total and we say, this is the total deficiencies that we have. Is this material or not material? And based on that, we will go and carry it out to management and we make decisions. So this is the testing of transaction. Now, what about if we have the same first situation, if the book value of the population is actually not available? So in that way, we don't know what is the total amount of the population. Why in the other two testing, we need to know the total amount? Because we need to compare the deficiencies that we have, the error with the actual total amount. Is it material or not? But in case we don't know the total book amount, we use variable testing. What's the meaning of variable testing? The meaning we select a sample. And based on the sample that we select, we go and see and verify, is there any variable between how it should be and how it is currently? And based on that, we can estimate exactly the errors that are happening. So we use variable testing for our uh, uh, testing of transactions.